Hi everyone, it's Maxi. Welcome to the video that the majority of you voted for in uh, the last Twitter poll, Unions and Work Ethic. So I'm gonna start by talking about why unions formed in the first place and then what unions have done for us all. And then I will conclude with my two cents on work ethic. So as we know, capitalism grew out of feudalism, but it was not a happy transition where people thought, hmm, I think free markets might make us free. And then they marched gladly into wage labor. Instead, capitalism was brutally imposed on people who were peasants at the time through violent and coercive means. As the power of merchants grew, feudal land was increasingly enclosed and privatized, and so the peasants who used to work that land and who used to own the means of production to some extent, in that they were able to produce food for themselves and then pay some tribute of that to the lords, they were evicted. Now landless and with no way to feed themselves or their families, they were forced to go in search of any wage work they could get just to survive. Pouring desperately into the urban centers to say that they were abused would be a a gross understatement. As Federici explains, urban wage workers could not form any associations and were even forbidden to meet in any place and for any reason. They could not carry arms or even the tools of their trade. They had no civil rights. They were exposed to the cruelest abuses at the hands of the merchants who spied on them, arrested them, tortured them, and hanged them at the least sign of trouble. This was certainly not an uncontested process. There were innumerable rebellions from people across Europe who refused to be caught in this wage servitude. And they sought to escape it through organizing communal egalitarian societies based around common property. These rebellions, however, were put down by elites in brutal bloodbaths. An example of a notorious rebellion was the Kett Rebellion, named after Robert Kett, that took place in Norfolk in 1549. At its peak, the rebels numbered 16,000, had an artillery, and defeated a government army of 12,000, and even captured Norwich, which at the time was the second largest English city. They drafted a program and a list of demands that included that from henceforth, no man shall enclose any more. They demanded that rents should be reduced and that everyone should be able to access the profits of all commons. They were put down by elites and government forces who slayed 3,500 of them, and hundreds more were left wounded. Kett and his brother William were hanged outside of Norwich's walls. The sheer force and violence and torture that was necessary to condition people to private property and force them into wage servitude leads Federici to say that capitalism was the counter-revolution that destroyed the possibilities that had emerged from the anti-feudal struggle. Possibilities which, if realized, might have spared us the immense destruction of lives and the natural environment that has marked the advance of capitalist relations worldwide. The capitalists pursuing their best interests as they ought to in this system, have the interest to work laborers as long as possible so long as their output remains high. They also have the interest to pay workers as little as possible so that the most amount of money made from the selling of those goods and services remains in the hands of the capitalists and is not paid out to the people who are actually doing the work. Anwar Shaikh lays this out brilliantly in one of his lectures so I will link that below, but in short, one main way to produce profit is to reduce your labor costs so that you reduce your overall cost of production. This means working laborers as hard as possible for as little as possible. Obviously, if there's a shortage of labor or if it's a job where it requires very technical skills and a lot of skills training, then in that case, individual laborers may have more power, I wouldn't say they have the upper hand, but they have more power with respect to capital because they can choose to leave their employment and go find something else if they aren't happy where they are. This is if there's a shortage of labor. However, capitalism as a system tends to produce an ever-growing pool of labor, an ever-growing reserve army of labor, which works to check any of the power that workers might have to actually choose the best employer who offers the highest price. The perpetual oversaturation of workers decimates workers' ability to do that. I explained this in detail in my reserve army of labor video, so I won't go too far into this here. But note that the neoliberal reforms of the 1970s made this all much, much worse. Trade liberalization made it so that workers everywhere in the world are competing against 
all other workers everywhere in the world, including places with much lower living standards and therefore much lower costs of labor than somewhere like North America, let's say. So wages have stagnated, work has become increasingly precarious. As well, automation continues to decimate our power as workers, which is why we see wages stagnate and labor share of output drop dramatically since moves to quote unquote free the market since the 1970s. So before we leave this section, let's take a look at some of the working conditions in the Industrial Revolution to see what this relative weakness of labor with respect to capital actually looks like in practice when workers have no protections. The working conditions in the Industrial Revolution were abysmal. People were overworked and were completely abused. What people don't talk about much with respect to the Industrial Revolution was that it was founded mainly on the labor of women and children. Why? because capitalists operating in their own interests as they should in this system seek to pay the lowest wages possible to keep profits highest. Women earned one third to one half that of male workers and children earned even less. The spinning jenny, for example, was created to be used by a young girl. The wheel was placed in a way that adults would find it very difficult to use for very long. Children were beaten and abused, as were other workers. However, since the capitalists knew that they could pay women and children the least, it could often be the case that a male wage worker would have to rely fully on the wages of his wife and children. Foster and Clark note that women's wages were so low that it was actually cheaper to pay women to pull barges along the canals rather than to have horses do it. They write of the egregiousness of work during this time period through Marx's example of the death of Mary Ann Walkley, a 20-year-old who had been employed in a seamstress establishment. She had been forced to work continuously for 26.5 hours in a room packed with 30 other young women, making dresses for a ball in honor of the new Princess of Wales. They had only one third of the necessary air in cubic feet per person, which was not unusual at the time. In 1844, a factory inspector reported that a typical working mother working in factories had half an hour to dress and suckle her infant and carry it out to nurse, one hour for household duties before leaving home, half an hour for actually traveling to the mill, 12 hours actual labor, one and a half hours for meals, half an hour for returning home at night, one and a half hours for household duties and preparing for bed, leaving six and a half hours for recreation, seeing and visiting friends and sleep. And in winter, when it's dark, half an hour extra time on the road to the mill and half an hour extra on the road home from the mill. Of course, this highlights the double exploitation of women under capitalism who were forced into wage work and also were expected to do the domestic unpaid labor. Naturally, this was horrible for working class families. The mortality rate for infants under two whose mothers were factory workers was said to be over 50%. The working class diet consisted mainly of tea and bread. People were getting ill. The water was polluted. It was not a good time. And so I hope that this all really illustrates what it looks like for the relative weakness of labor with respect to capital, like how that actually plays out when workers are completely unprotected. This is what a for-profit competitive model looks like in practice. Well, you can thank unions for the eight hour workday, which some are now admitting is actually too long as well. The Swedish six hour model is being recognized as much more efficient. Um, not that we should mark what we're doing based on efficiency. However, not everyone even enjoys an eight hour workday. There are many places in the world where people are unprotected and they work 12 to 16 hour days in horrible conditions, in sweatshop conditions, working for the most meager of pay. But what else? Besides maternity leave, weekends off, and workers' compensation, tell me one thing that the unions have really contributed to the workplace. Fair wages. Outlawing discrimination. And did you know union workers make 30% more than non-union workers? How cool is that? Yes, and the unions ended child labor. That's right. You know kids used to work in shit conditions like sweatshops. And don't forget employer-based health coverage and sick days. I love those. It's really difficult to have a strong middle class without unions. Yeah, and you know, unions also fought to make laws protecting whistleblowers who exposed corporate corruption. I mean, they really did that. Come on, who does that? <laughs> no one except unions. <laughs> okay! Thinking about the inner mechanics of capitalism and how it has to grow 3.6% every year means that profits have to grow every year, means that labor has to be disciplined and decimated every year, which is exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing labor become more and more precarious and wages stagnate and labor share of output drop, this is by design. The only way 
to shelter yourselves from that onslaught from capital is to try to use your collective power. And, and even then, you don't have much collective power if the reserve army of labor continues to grow, which it does every year by design. And so the collective power of workers is still reduced, whether or not they are unionizing or not. However, since the 1970s, unions have been slashed. In the late 1970s, 27% of American workers were unionized, and now it is only 12%. But work would not be remotely bearable or livable at all if unions had not come together and, and fought for these things. For such wealthy countries in the global north, with such wealth and technology, we could have it right now so that we would all be able to reduce the number of hours that we spent doing menial tasks or menial work. Wasn't that the goal in the first place? Wasn't the goal to advance ourselves so that we could have more leisure time? The more technologically advanced that we get and the more wealth that we produce, the more people are precarious, the more people are forced to work for meager pay and, and have less and less time for leisure, for family, for relationships, for self-care. What are we doing? If all of the wealth that we produce were redistributed, we could already be living in this new paradigm right now. We wouldn't be working two, three jobs, slogging away, working nights and weekends, but that wouldn't be freedom, would it? That wouldn't be freedom, no. No, it's, um, what is it? Yeah, yeah, the free, the free market makes us free, yeah. So given what we know about the history of capitalism, the inner mechanisms of capitalism, how capital accumulates, the charge that unions destroy work ethic and that this is something that we should be really concerned about is pretty laudable. Why would we get mad at people who are trying to shelter themselves from this onslaught, from this wage servitude, from this precarity? Why would we be mad at them and not the system that is driving this? Can we just stop for a second and think about why we care so much about productivity and consumption for their own sake? Productivity for what? It's productivity for the accumulation of capital. And that is it. There are very few industries that produce goods or services that are real essentials of life. So what is work ethic? What is work ethic? We want to bust up unions to keep people as precarious, as desperate as possible so that they will work anywhere they can as many hours as possible in order to feed themselves? That's, that's what we want? Can we just stop for a moment and think, what is our end game here? What kind of society are we trying to build? In North America, people already only have like one or two weeks vacation in an entire year. Five days off in an entire year. That's, that's good? Is that a demonstration that we have good work ethic here? That people are really down to work? Why would we define ourselves based on efficiency in this system that produces so much just for the sake of producing money? For no other purpose. Why do we care so much about efficiency and profitability if all of those profits are being concentrated into fewer and fewer hands, which are not ours? <laughs> They're not ours. And what is good work ethic? I mean, do you think that someone who came into money and started a business and is quite wealthy, do you think that they work harder than a single mom working two jobs, working to support her kids and get them through school? Why do we want to see people so pressed and so stressed? Why do we want to see people pushed so hard? Why is everything that we do based around productivity in the first place? I mean, I think we need a serious paradigm shift. I'm going to give an example of my former union, my former union now, who has been on strike for the past nine weeks and who a lot of people are saying, you know, what's wrong with them? They already have it better than so many other universities. Why can't they just accept what they have? Why do they have to do this? Well, let's see. As a TA, you make $5,000 per term, which is four months. You have to pay 2,000 of that back to the university. <laughs> so 3,000 in four months. If you manage to land a contract faculty position, so you're actually the course director and lecturer for the course, you get 8,000 for four months. It's very difficult to live on these wages. I mean, on the TA wage, there's no way. So you end up having to take on more 
and more work. I mean, these are already full-time jobs. So you end up having to just take on more and more work to the point that you're no longer effective in any job that you're doing. You're not effective in your teaching. You're not effective in the other work that you're doing. You're not effective in your research. The quality of everything you do suffers because you are spread so thin. So why is it that we want to decimate people's ability to feel secure, to have that extra time, to have that time to spend with family, to have that time to spend pursuing their passions or doing Doing their other productive work that would advance them in their careers, like their writing, like their research, etc. Why do we think that people should just accept how, how it is? People should just accept that and just struggle. I mean, why? Why are we doing this? We have all the wealth, all the technology in the world. Why are we forcing people to struggle through these things? There is no good reason. So even if in some unions people feel comfortable and they feel like they don't have to put out so much output all the time, which of course I'm sure happens, I'm not concerned about them. I'm not, I'm not concerned about them. I'm concerned about this entire system that does not make any sense at all. And that left to its own devices will continue to decimate unions, will continue to decimate labor, will continue to destroy wages and you know job security and the like. I mean, unions themselves are not going to destabilize the power of capital. They're not. They're going to shelter workers from the worst brunt of it, but they're not gonna actually, you know, challenge or overthrow the system. And this is what David Harvey talks about in terms of militant particularism, in the sense that, you know, we sometimes can get so involved in our own local struggle with our within our own workplace or even our own industry that we end up fighting to make concessions, you know, with capitalists that are good, but they don't actually fundamentally change their relations of power. They don't, they still leave workers vulnerable for those things to be rolled back. I mean, it, it's not revolution, right? So we always have to keep our eye on the bigger picture, but in terms of work ethic, I mean, there is no reason to believe that if I did not have my former union now, if I did not have that union making sure that I'm able to have access to health care and benefits and things like that. If I didn't have that, if I didn't have this union fighting for these meager things just to keep me alive, how would my work ethic improve? I would have the exact same work ethic that I do now. I would have to do the exact same. I would have to do more than I have to do now, which would make me less effective and make me produce less quality work overall. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not concerned with work ethic for the sake of working or for the sake of productivity under capitalism. Anyway, thanks for watching everyone. Um, sorry that this kind of turned into a rant, um, but I hope you enjoyed the video. I want to say a special thanks to my patrons now and a super special shout out to Faustin Talacha and Daniel Melanson. Melanson. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. If you like this channel, please consider supporting me via Patreon. It really goes a long way. Check out my podcast at veganvanguardpodcast.com. Check me out on Facebook and Twitter. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in another video.